as well. So, okay. Uh, I've got um, a discussion board coming up in my economics class about the millionaire method versus social security. So I've got a couple of slides that I put together with your questions that you've prepared and some general ideas about investing and then some very specific things that address your your questions and some strategies that I put together as well. So am I able to share my screen? I hope so. Okay, then we're gonna do that. All right, well, let's... Uh, yep, um, we see without, it. Without further ado, this is how I uh, thought of it. Very good. All right, so good afternoon. We got uh, mm -hmm. a personal finance class and you've put together some good questions and answers that our main topic today is about long-term investment strategies. And I'd like to put together, uh, I'd like to think about these things as strategies. So um, I, 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 I'd like you to put together an action item uh, list while we're talking here or after watching this video. So actual uh, things that you're going to do, you can write it down You say, you know, start saving, have a budget, whatever that might be, call my insurance company, right? Uh, invest in such and such a stock. Make a list of things that you're gonna do. And that's how, you know, anyone who's productive knows that's how it gets done. You make a plan, then you implement the plan. Okay, so right off the bat, why should we invest? And weirdly enough, even though we talk quite a bit in investing about money, the actual, I think, the purpose of investing is so you don't have to talk about money. I find that folks that live paycheck to paycheck have money as their master. It, it almost looms over their life. It, 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 it really it, it dictates so much of what they do and how they think about things. And it's, it's not what you're meant for. You're meant for greater things than that. And so by putting money in its place, and having it provide for you instead of you being, uh, you know, slave to it, you'll you'll be better off. It's it's kind of weird because you know you th you'd think that talking about money all the time that it would that it's the most important thing, but of course money is not the most important thing. It just seems like the most important thing when you don't have it. Once you have it, you can think about the really important things in life, and that's why you invest. There's other reasons too. You have financial freedom. You've probably mentioned that. You get a better credit score. That's an unexpected bonus that comes from it. If you start, uh, you know, shows up as uh, that you have a you know, positive net worth, better rates on your insurance that comes with that as well. And then it makes it easier to save and easier to put that aside. You actually get better job offers. I've had several jobs where um, I've had to uh, had 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 to allow them to do a credit check on me before I got the the job offer, you know, everything looked good, the interviews went well and everything. And then they, as part of the security and, and other things that they were doing, it was provisional upon um, uh, what, uh, what I look like. And for instance, having a job where I'm helping other people invest, if I myself didn't have a, you know, decent enough investment portfolio, then um, that would uh, uh, denied me the job opportunities that, uh, that I've had. So I'm really happy to share these things with you. And um, if you think about what investing is, uh, you know, the money is meant to be spent. The question is, should you spend it now or spend it later? Would it be better? You know, would it bring you a greater amount of utility now or later? And so what you're doing is spending most of your money now and some of your money later. And by, by investing, you're putting some of that money towards another purpose. Now the question, you know, when you take a look at, at uh, wealth accumulation, it basically follows this, this formula, if I will, right? Income is what you make, but uh, wealth is what you still have after you've spent some of what you've made. And so wealth is the difference between that, really. It's, a, it's an accumulation of your savings over many years and, and how it's invested together. Now, we all start off in life as spenders, and pretty soon, right, uh, you know, you spend what you make. You know, if your grandma gives you $5, you spend the $5 on something. That's what you're supposed to do. And I, you know, sometimes in, uh, I've heard people misquote, they say that money is the root of all evil. That's not true. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's the actual quote. Money is just a, a resource that can be used for good or bad or anything else. Like when your grandma gave you five bucks, she wasn't giving you something evil. But if you kissed the $5 and danced around instead of kissing your grandma, Eh, maybe you know you're you're on the wrong path. You know, when someone says that they love money, I always get 
a little worried that they've, you know, that their priorities are at a skew. But anyway, you spend. That's how we all start off in life. We spend. And then sooner or later, we all learn that we need to save, even if we're just saving up for a, um, you know, vacation that we want to take in a couple of months, or if we saving up to buy presents for somebody and we, you know, we figure out that we need to save. Otherwise, we're always going to have to produce and, and, and um, uh, it's not that far of a jump to go from saver to investor, because when you are saving, you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to spend it right now. Why don't I put it someplace where it's going to be doing some good? And so in the accumulation of wealth, I've given you this idea that stock is ownership in the company. And when you own a company or many hundreds of companies, as you might, when, when you invest in a mutual fund, that that company uh, is uh, providing jobs and services and goods to, to the public. And if they're run well, then they will increase in value. And you as part owner of that company, as an investor, will also do well. And you can also know that it's a it's a positive sum game. See, it's very much different than say the going going to play a poker game. If you walk out of the poker room with more money than you started with, you that means someone at the poker table, or maybe many someone's at the poker table, lost the same amount of money. That's a zero sum game. Same thing with like uh, you know with other types of gambling and other types of conflicts, right? If someone has to someone wins and someone else loses in a zero sum game. But in the stock market, that's not the case. Everyone can be a winner because you're creating new wealth and you're creating new jobs and creating new services and innovations. And there's a positive sum game. It's a game that you're participating in as probably as an investor, but also as an employee, as a consumer, as a you know, third party and a stakeholder. And, and everybody can win in this idea. So that's why, that's why I'm so drawn to the stock market as opposed to say the um, uh, Forex market or, or other types of things where the, uh, the positive sum game is, uh, is, is less evident. Okay, so uh, one last point I added here to the slide. If everyone owned stock, then everyone would enjoy the prosperity of our growth. Certain problems and complaints would disappear. Can anyone offer to me what uh, kind of problems and complaints that we're hearing these days that I might be referring to? Guys, just jump in when he asks the question, okay? Right, so there's just all this talk about um, a, a disparity between like the haves and the have nots. But one little comment I'll make about that is that that uh, I find that a lot of people are being lied to, that they are told that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. That's not true. The rich are getting richer and the poor are getting richer. But because of the, there, there's a, definitely a disparity, but, but the, the rising tide has really lifted all boats. It just doesn't seem like that. So the, the poor are getting richer as well. But you know, like just with the adoption of capitalism, we've eliminated over 1.5 billion people, lifted them out of poverty in the last 20 years. So that, and, and having said that, we'll, we'll just take a look at this, this other idea, right? This uh, disparity, right? So what happens is we find that the haves, they, it's not that they just have wealth, what they have is stock ownership. And there's so many people that don't invest. They, so many people that don't buy stock. They rely only on their paycheck, let's say, and, and they spend it and they don't, they don't tr do anything to accumulate wealth. So what we would expect is as the economy grows, that anyone who owns stock would have more wealth and have a piece of that. And I strongly believe that if everybody owns stock, there wouldn't be that kind of disparity because you would own some of these but, you know, businesses and, and you'd own portions of this and you'd be enjoying that higher amount of wealth and, and you'd have some say in the company as well because every stock, you know, every, every share is one vote. So it's, it's very, very democratic. It's very, very democratic. Much more democratic than say, um, well, we, we won't talk too much about some other things like that, but it's, it's extremely democratic when, when people can in fact uh, have a voice and be able to be heard, not just 
uh, once every once in a while, like in the in the political elections. But with in the marketplace, you get to vote every day with every dollar all the time, and that is a very responsive um, type of type of way to run a, run a a good feedback mechanism. Moving right along. Uh, a question that was asked was, uh, should I get out of debt first? So the way I think about that is you've got, you know, all debt is bad. Some debt is not so bad, but the, um, uh, there's high interest debt. And so if you have a credit card that you're paying, uh, making payments on and it's charging you 25% a month or something, you definitely want to kill that. You want to eliminate any kind of high interest debt. And that's a guaranteed return, right? So every dollar that you put towards your high interest debt is a guaranteed return on the money that you won't have to pay anymore on that piece. So it's really hard to find a guaranteed investment of anything that approaches 25% or 20%. So if you have high interest debt, definitely get out of that first. But um, some debt, uh, especially the low interest debt should not keep you from investing. So if you have a car loan or a mortgage or student loans, they're charging somewhere between you know zero and eight percent or something like that. Then you could say, well, uh, I you can carry that debt and still invest because you would expect that your investments uh, will be earning somewhere between say seven and twelve percent a year, sometimes better, but you know right in that right in that range. And so if you you, you don't want to miss out on say a ten percent return because you were paying a five percent. A debt. So that's the idea about that. It's a, it's a strategy if you think about it. So if possible, try to get those high interest credit cards paid off. If you can't get them paid off quickly, see if you can just get them reduced down to some lower interest rate, transfer them over to something else. Uh, but budgeting is essential. So whatever caused the debt to, to accumulate um, is, is a reflection of you know, a number of different factors. And it, uh, budgeting is the key to, to preventing yourself from getting back into debt. Okay, how should I be earning before I can afford to invest, right? Say, so say I've only got a small job, it doesn't pay very much. I, I, when I get a real job, then I'll start to invest. You, you hear people say that. And I'm, I'm gonna encourage you that um, uh, that's not the case. So in, I'll illustrate it with a, a true story. Uh, there's a guy, Dwayne, uh, up at the top of the, my block. He works at the Stewart's. And that's how I got to know him. So I'd, you know, I'd make chit chat with him uh, when it wasn't too busy. And he'd tell me about how his life was going. And I'd talk to him about how my life was going, you know, just over while I'm buying eggs and milk and things like that, stewards. So, but, um, uh, and I, uh, stewards, if, if you know, they take a, they do an employee stock ownership plan. So you get to, not only do you get your pay, but you have some share in the profits that come from stewards. And so that got us talking about investing and I enjoy spreading the word to get as many people invested as possible. And he was interested in this. I'm kind of told him some of the things I'm telling you today and you know, over a, over a series of visits and everything. And he got going, he started investing in the uh, Vanguard 500 fund. He started putting some of his money aside there. And then um, I, uh, well, one night I was taking the, the recycling down to the end of uh, my, uh, my driveway and what I, what I do is I set aside not only the recycling in its own container, but any of the returnables, you know, the, the, the deposit cans, the five cent cans, I, I put that in a separate bag and I just kind of put it next to the recycling. I figure someone could use it. And lo and behold, Dwayne was uh, at the end of the street, he was collecting cans. So I said, hey, Dwayne, how are the kids and everything? We chit chatted a little bit. And then I said, hey, I gotta ask you, well, what he says about the cans? I said, yeah. He says, these are making me a millionaire. Do tell, I say. He says, well, the steward's job is just enough to keep me alive. You know, I'm just barely with the what money I make at Stewart's and uh, you know, pay my bills and uh, there's nothing left over. But I you told me how that if you save forty dollars a week for forty years and invest it at ten percent then that'll give you more than a million. And I'm about to show you that too. I sent, sent along some illustrations for you that you may have looked at. Anyway, Dwayne says, so that's what I'm doing. I, I, I figure that's uh, $6 a day extra I gotta make somewhere. So he does his steward's job and he figures out some way to make an extra $40 a week. And that money is not to be spent on something. He invests that. So I think that, that it was very inspiring. So I asked him if, if he, you know, would mind if I shared that with my students? And he said, absolutely. 
and and if you consider it that way that that whatever if you what you need is forty dollars a week to make you a millionaire and to to reach this amount of uh, accumulated wealth right then then the question is how can you earn an extra forty dollars a week and use it for that particular purpose and there's that's um, maybe the way I'm answering that question. Okay, maybe I can show that illustration here. I'm gonna have to, uh, if I can put this, what do we have? Is this is the millionaire machine. Did you uh, give this thing a try? So here, let's let's say we have a, um, let's say it was back in 2002 when I met Dwayne and he didn't have any money saved up at all. And uh, based upon how he was investing, he's expecting to get a 10% return each year. And he's putting aside $40 a week, which is $2,000 annually. So um, that uh, would mean that, and, uh, and I'm, the reason I put it together this way is so you could watch the compound interest grow. What I uh, wanted to show you is that even though in the beginning of the year, he didn't have any money. By the end of the year, he had a little bit more than he had put in because he put in the $2,000 plus he earned 10% on that $2,000. So he had 2,288, which is the amount he started the next year with. Now, as far as this you know, illustration goes, there's, there's some things I could critique about it, but the reason I give it to you is to show the, show the growth and to appreciate what happened. So if he started back there in 2002, then the next year he would not only have more money at the end of the year because he put more money in, he's still putting in the $40 a week, but also he's earning interest on the money that he put in initially as well. So then he starts the third year with more than twice as much as he had put in because it's growing a little bit each year. After seven years, he'll have $17,000. So so this is 2008. By the time I bumped into him, let's say it was 2015, and I had been talking to him for 15 years, he had $56,000 saved up, which is substantial, right? And this is, uh, that's at the end of uh, 14 years. So interestingly enough, this plan will, this $40 a week at 10% interest will make you a millionaire in 40 years. But it doesn't look like he's halfway to a million when he's more than halfway through, right? So in 2022, when he will have been doing this for 20 years, right? He'll still only have a balance of 146. So there's like, it's both you see the compounding happen, but you're also kind of mystified as to how, how $146,000 saved up after 20 years could be a million dollars after 40 years. You know, would it, do what you'd think it would be more than that, but it's not. And there's a lesson in that too, when it, that it may not look like you're on the right road. And even though you've been doing the right things for a while and you need to be patient and have perspective. There's too many people that are kind of, they throw their life away basically, even though they've been doing all the right steps because they're getting impatient. You know, they're around 40 years old or 50 years old and it doesn't look like life is, shaping up to the way they wanted it to be and so they they do something squirrely you, you, you've, you've seen people like this you know what i'm talking about okay so i'm not by the way i'm not being critical of the, everyone has their own walk and everything it's just that i don't want you to do it i want you to just remind it like hey i'm you just tell yourself you're going to have moments in your life where it won't look like you're doing the right thing and you'll be tempted to just cash out everything because you're not on the right road but you you know stick with it because you are on the right road so even though after 20 years, you have 146,000, it does continue to grow. And at this point, 10% of 146,000 is 14. So you're still putting in the 2,000 a year of new money, you know, $40 a week, but you're earning $14,000 a year, 10% of what you put in. And then after, uh, um, uh, let's see, that would be 27 years. And this is 35 years, you have 620. And after 40 years, you, you break the million. And a million dollars is about enough to give you $50,000 every year for the rest of your life. You know, indefinitely, really. You, you could take the million, you'd, put, you'd scale down your investment, you'd get a steady 5% payout from that. 5% 5, 5 of a million would be $50,000, and that would pay out 
uh, you know, and you wouldn't have to touch principle and so forth. And, and, you know, as a, as a way to consider. So it's not that uh, being a millionaire is the important thing, but if you, if you did this and you paired your life with another person who was also doing this, well, you and, you know, cause a lot of people, they plan their life, uh, you know, with someone else. And so, so you could uh, both have, you know, collectively you'd have the $2 million and that would give you uh, the equivalent of a hundred thousand dollars a year. So something to think about. So I invite you to use this, uh, uh, piece here. I threw some illustrations in there so you'd have an idea. Here's the performance of the stock over uh, a girl named Amber who uh, was born in 1995. And these are the years of the of, of the investment. Some were great years, some were terrible years, but the average return was a good amount. Here's an encouragement to get into uh, using your employee sponsored retirement plan. And, you know, if you're putting in $900 a year of your contributions and the company is matching at $900 a year, then you're at $1,800 a year. And you, you can see that uh, uh, even with a modest, let's say 9% annualized return, you'd hit a million dollars after the, uh, uh, by, by making these contributions. Um, so, so different illustrations that I offer on there too. I've also given you what's the optimal portfolio. So if you're wondering about like where to invest your money, I say that there's three places to put it, cash, bonds, and stock. How much should you have in each amount is a question of how much risk you're willing to take on. And I've given you the risk tolerance quiz as well, so you can take that every year and see where you're at. But let's say if you're a moderate growth investor, then it would be optimal to have 45% of your money in short and medium term AAA rated bonds. So you'd say 45% in bonds, 32% in a large company stock, 18% in small company stock, and 5% in foreign stock. And foreign stock doesn't have to scare anybody. You know, if Nokia phones, Nestle, uh, British Petroleum, Toyota, uh, Ikea, all foreign companies, right? Just they could be, you know, uh, good solid blue chip companies that are uh, headquartered outside the U.S. Okay, so the idea is, you know, not to put all your eggs in one basket. But if you're wondering how many baskets and how many eggs in each basket, then you would lead you use your your own level of risk tolerance to guide you. Uh, the way that I, I in these retirement seminars that I give. I, I tell people that if they tell me how much risk they're comfortable with, I'll tell them what's the optimal amount of money to have in cash, bonds, and stock. Now, a couple of the questions that you had asked was like, you know, exactly how much should I have in the bank versus how much should I have in stock? We, there weren't any questions about bonds, but I, I do, I'll, I'll touch on it right now. That a, a bond is a, a guaranteed rate of return. It, it, it's less risky than stock, but has a has more a higher amount of return than cash, at, or you know, let's say a, a certificate of deposit or something like that. So it, it has it's a nice between uh, time. And when the when the economy goes down, the value of the bonds goes up. So it's it offers balance as far as a counter cyclical uh, investment. Uh, you'll notice that people that are more conservative, the stable investors or conservative investors, then they are uh, uh, interested in having some amount of their money liquid. It it's prudent for them to have, say, 5% of their money in, in something like a certificate of deposit or commercial paper. But uh, beyond that, if you're, you know, if you're invested in the long term, you shouldn't have that, that money invested in uh, cash, it's not. It's uh, you. You you have an emergency fund, but you shouldn't have it invested in cash because the cash always loses against uh, inflation. So it, there's a cost of keeping your money in cash. It's, it's very risky in terms of inflation. You're you're bound to lose, you know, somewhere between two and four percent every year uh, that you leave your money in cash, or that money that you leave in cash loses some percentage of its value every year due to inflation. So uh, that's, a, that's a serious thing to consider. You have to invest against inflation and the only thing that beats inflation is stock. So because stock is volatile and it can be up or down, you choose some stock portfolio that has a lot of stock in it. And I'm gonna encourage you to look at index funds for that. Uh, we'll get back to our uh, regular scheduled program. Here we are, okay. 
So there's the uh, story of Dwayne with the cans and the millionaire method. So I wanted to share that uh, with you. Okay. Joe, can I just um, interrupt you for sure. a second? I know we, we just briefly um, talked about matching for 401k. And um, <clears throat> my question is around the fact that when a company has a 401k and uh, they happen to go out of business, um, I know that it would be required that the 401k would be insured. Um, I was in a situation, um, well, the money that is in the 401k will go with the person. It doesn't really matter if they go uh, out of business, correct? Because That's the money right. so is yours. Right, it's portable and there's, a, there's an administrator uh, over the 401k, which is separate from the company by, by requirement. So often people are allowed to invest in their own company stock within their 401k. So that, if, if the company were to go bankrupt, any money that you had invested in the company, specifically, you know, the stock in the company would, would be lost. But, but the 401k itself is not lost because it's being administered by, let's say, Fidelity or Tia Cref or right. by, by some, by, by, by a administrator, which is not the company. So, right. And, and so you're uh, think of it that way that your your investments with the in your 401k are completely safe from the bankruptcy of the company. Now the company match um, often comes in at the end of the year. So let's say if they're they you put in two thousand dollars and they're promising to match that two thousand dollars. So if last year they put in the two thousand dollars and it's invested in whatever way you wanted it to be invested, it matched your investments. Now this year you've put in almost two thousand dollars. It's December first, and they go bankrupt. If they didn't get a chance to put in that company match yet for this year, then you're not going to get that. Uh, they're, if they're bankrupt, it's it's considered part of your pay, but how much of that you're going to get and where it's going to fall is uh, is uh, nothing to hope for. But all of the money you made as far as contributions, all of the growth that was in there, and any prior company match from past years is all secured in, what, in whatever you've invested in within the 401k plan and you're insulated against uh, 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 insolvency there. Right, um, another, another thing that I brought to my students' attention is something that has actually happened to me. I said, you know, when, uh, when a company has a pension, you can't always count on that to be there. Um, and, and specifically saying when I had worked for St. Clair's Hospital, I, I was there between th 13 and 15 years. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, um, they decided that they were no longer going to uh, insure the pension. And um, it's, it has since tanked because of how it was being managed. Uh, and that means I do not have any pension. And just recently, uh, in, within the past two years in the news, there's a lawsuit against uh, the fact that there are people out there that were notified that they were only going to get pay pension payments for six more months. And um, you know, it, it's just something that uh, I had, you, you know, I personally have experienced and I'm lucky that I'm not, you know, some of the 80 year old people that are, are in that situation where they were notified that that was going to go away. No, it's, that's criminal. They, the, especially all of the pension, um, you know, malfeasance in the past and their various, the various things that have been done, the, the body of law uh, surrounding and protecting pensions for, are extensive. And so the, 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 the St. Clair's is, a, is an example of something that's right, that's not just tragic, and it is tragic, but it's also criminal that they, how they had uh, uh, mismanaged it and didn't, didn't maintain their promises. There's even, even uh, there's all sorts of terms that, um, having to do with the pension, but I think it would be fair to say that all of our students uh, would, should not be expecting a pension because very, very few of them will work for an employer who offers a pension and, um, and those pensions are, uh, you know, are uh, a, a benefit which is fading away. So, so um, uh, I thought I'd survey the class here for this one. Um, the question is, how much do I need to get started? So 
uh, uh, you all know how to use your your uh, Zoom device to you know raise your hand or uh, or indicate if you think the answer is if you how much do you think you need to save up before you can invest is it a hundred thousand dollars or uh, I invested like five hundred bucks not too long ago. <laughs> all right, you given given the answer, so it's not ten thousand. It's not even two thousand. Maybe two hundred. Maybe nothing. So, um, uh, so we got what you, uh, I don't see your name. Wait, it's Rick, Nick. So uh, uh, yeah, Nick started off with $500 and, and definitely, um, I, and there were some, I didn't, I didn't see whose name was associated with each of the questions, but uh, some of you were uh, evidently aware of Acorns and of um, Robin Hood and uh, there's, there's these uh, apps that allow you to, you know, you buy something for $10 and 32 cents and they say, well, you want, do you want us just to charge $10 and 32 cents or should we charge you $11 and take that 68 cents and put it in your Acorn account and now you have that money and every time the Acorn account gets to be five bucks or so, then you buy some stock with it and it accumulates little pennies here and there and you automatically get involved in in that. So so uh, you know, even a person who doesn't have anything saved up could download the free Acorn app and and start doing that. And anytime they make a purchase, they could start uh, in right away and and doing that. And if if some of you in the class have something like that or a Robinhood account, I think when Robinhood, if you refer, uh, they have these promotional pro. pro Project. So if you, if a peer gets another peer to sign up for it, then you both get like a free share of stock or some kind of bonus. So you as a class should definitely be sharing with each other the, um, you know, the, the, the information that you have and experiences you've had with this because you'll, you'll both benefit. There's a lot of mutuality there. Yeah. Yeah. You can even invest the rest of your change up to a dollar, you know, nice. the remainder. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a user, which one do you use, Jennifer? Actually, right now I'm not using anything. You know, I just try to say, my son goes to LaSalle, so I'm not really investing right now. You know, I'm just trying to get through uh, this degree and go back to work full time at some point. All right. So yeah, I will be investing some point. <laughs> right yeah. on word about his college. <laughs> yeah, I invest through TD Ameritrade and I, I actually, one of my buddies sent me his Robinhood link and he was just like, hey, you know, I know you don't use Robinhood, but do you want to sign up and you'll get a free stock and I'll get a free stock. He went on his uh, Robinhood account and he had gotten like Ford, which isn't really all that, you know, expensive of a stock. I had gotten Apple and I had said, hey, you know what? I just got a free share of Apple. I'm, I might as well buy a couple more shares of Apple in my Robinhood. And now they've just been sitting in there. I've actually accumulated like good, good growth over, you know, the last few years with it. Wow, that's like winning the lottery. Yeah, that's that, you know, so the Ford, that one share of Ford is a $9 gift to your friend. Exactly, yeah. That one share of Apple is, what, what's Apple going for today? 118, I think it's trading live at. Yeah, so it, which you could just sell. Like if you had wanted to, you could have, you, you doubled down on it, but uh, you could have just made yourself $118 right there for, for um, you know, for, for being a good friend. I love that. These are great stories. All right. Friends got so, a piece it's like two hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Good for you. So, um, no, none of you actually asked it this way, but I I like to ask questions like this. Hey, let's hear your whole lecture in thirty seconds. I'm like, okay, um, spend less than you make, invest the money you save in a diversified portfolio, live a long time. That's it. I can do it in ten seconds. That's it. That's that's <laughs> the message. Okay, now. The compound interest accumulates. That's what I was showing you with that with that uh, millionaire machine that you have. And the money earns money, which earns money. And money invested creates growth. It creates innovation. Creates jobs. So you're you're not you're not just helping yourself. You're you're helping society. And you become an owner of hundreds of companies when you invest, especially if you're using a mutual fund. And here's a great video I thought I'd share with you. Ready? We asked people a question. How much money do you have in your pocket right now? 
I have forty dollars. Fifty-three. Twenty-one. Do you think the money in your pocket could make an impact on something as big as your retirement? A chance. I don't think so. Probably not. It's hard to imagine how something so small can help with something so big. But if you start putting that toward your retirement every week and let it grow over time for 20 to 30 years, that retirement challenge might not seem so big after all. So that's not supposed to be a um, commercial for Prudential, but it was a good com that's that's a good commercial. Uh, Dan Gilbert's a a behavioral economist. Sorry, I threw the timing off. I thought I checked the chat while I was watching that for that one minute. <laughs> but um, your uh, um, I think it's very powerful to think about how little steps in the right direction get to accumulate a very large amount. Um, here's the piece about Social Security I wanted to share. Uh, so you're you're all familiar with Social Security. If uh, uh, you if if for no other way that you always see FICA on your paycheck, and uh, that is taking out 7.65 percent of your pay. So all of your money up to the Social Security wage base draw is uh, susceptible to the uh, FICA tax. 6.2 percent of that uh, uh, that is uh, Medicare is 1.45 percent and Social Security is 6.2% of your pay. So everybody who works has to contribute to Social Security. And so a typical worker pays about $2,000 a year, which is why I show the millionaire method as an alternative, which is also about $2,000 a year. So a typical person does in fact have that $2,000, but the, the government crowds it out and takes that $2,000 from you and promises to give you Social Security later on, which gives you a retirement benefit age 65. You can have a reduced benefit when you're 62. A typical retiree under Social Security is collecting about $1,000 this month. So the, the average is, is $1,300. The reason why the difference between average and median is, you know, is, um, is that there's a whole lot more people that are receiving 1,000 than people that are receiving 1,300. But, there's also a death benefit for orphans, widows, and a disability portion to Social Security, which, which is um, the costs and benefits of Social Security. So uh, we won't talk today about you know what sort of um, uh, what the conditions of Social Security are, but I thought I'd just lay that out so you have an idea about whether you know how Social Security will probably supplement your retirement income in some degree, and you'd want to make up the difference because this would be insufficient for probably the type of life that you'd like to have and enjoy when you're in your 60s and beyond. So the um, next question here is to compare uh, investing the same amount of money, let's say, if you put in $40 a week as a cost, there's that opportunity cost and discipline required, which is painful. Fighting temptation is never fun. Right, so <laughs> costs of investing, which I mean, we're gonna mitigate that a little bit, I'll get to that. And then there's some stress of being responsible for your own life. I put those down as costs of, of doing these investing, right? But the benefits are that if you did save $40 a week and invested it, you'd have a million dollars, which is enough for $5,000 a month for life, which is five times better than Social Security. So the, contra the cost is the same as Social Security, but the benefit is five times better than Social Security. See? Okay. It also gives you the flexibility. Like, do you have to wait till you're age 62 to spend it? No. You can spend it whenever you want to. That's the whole idea. It's your money at any age. And it also is part of your estate. So, like, one of the arguments that were often used about Social Security, right, is that there's all these rules about who gets the money if you die and who can't get the money if you die. And, you know, who's married and who's not and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's just, it's, it creates the incentives for some bizarre behavior. If, if it's just your money and you can use it any way you want to, and there's no complications about that, then there aren't any need to follow what, know what the, the special government rules are like you do with social security. You can just, you know, live your life. That's the idea. Plus you get the rewards which come from good planning, which you'd have to put down as a benefit of having the investments. So 
thought I'd throw those two in there as the as a comparison. Investing, which is say a market solution versus Social Security, which would be a government solution for the same problem. And one of them is, um, you know, they have different costs and benefits. One that uh, a discerning person can easily uh, evaluate and um, and see which one is more efficient. Okay. We had a question about mutual funds, which is great because I wanted to talk about that. Sometimes people just wonder if an exchange traded ETF or an exchange traded fund is the same thing as a mutual fund. It is. They're very, they're, they are the same. They're, 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 the slight characteristics uh, difference is, is um, uh, you know, uh, academic. But when you're thinking about mutual funds, I want you to consider my, um, my neighbor who has this gigantic picture window. I want to, can I draw something? I think I, you're allowed to, you're allowed to draw, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So when I think about mutual funds, I think about my, my neighbor. He has this gigantic picture window. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And when the, when the day is bright or the parade is going by, he's got the best seat on the, in the neighborhood, right? Now me, I got a different window. It's the, like the same size, but um, it's, uh, oh, jeez. Yeah, I live in jail. <laughs> so, no. uh, it's like this. Okay. It's one of these kind of windows, these colonial jobs. Okay. All right. So when the kids are playing baseball in the street, my neighbor is worried because a single, you know, bad errant ball ruins his entire portfolio. His whole window is smashed with one bad thing. Right. So if you think about it, he's invested in one thing, it's his one stock. He's invested everything in GE, for instance, you know? So, whereas General Electric is just one of the stocks here, right? And so if, if the baseball, I don't want the baseball to come through and, and cause this company to go bankrupt. It's one of the many companies that I own through the mutual fund, but it's not that big of a deal because some competitor just picked up market share, right? Siemens just made extra money or Honeywell is now doing better because GE just went bankrupt. Whereas if you, you know, if you work for GE and you live close to GE and you have all your investments in GE, when GE goes bankrupt, your house is now worthless, you're out of a job and all of your investments are gone. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So a mutual fund is much more like this window over here, this idea where you've diversified your money across many, many different things. Now, the difference between a passively managed investment and an actively managed mutual fund is whether the manager just follows an algorithm and a formula, whether there's a human element to it or not. So in active management, you're paying extra money to a manager who says that they know when to buy and when not to buy, and they're trying to time the market, and they know when, you know, when to sell and everything else. And, and so the actively managed mutual funds you would think would be better, but they're not. They don't perform better, I, you know, like maybe one out of 10 any particular year is doing better than the passively managed ones. But weirdly enough, the ones that are just set up to, as index funds outperform the actively managed funds consistently. So the, the, the actively managed funds, even though there'll always be some that do better than the passively managed ones, they, they rarely do better every year. So you have like a, you have an actively managed mutual fund that you're paying extra money for, and it sometimes does better than the passively managed ones, but most of the time it doesn't. And then almost all the actively managed funds do worse than the passively managed funds consistently. You know, 90% of them do worse. So then you say, well, why would I pay extra for the actively managed fund then? Maybe I should just put my money in a passively managed mutual fund, have it diversified out, pay practically nothing to have that, that, that uh, investment and just coast along and let my investments do that. So I'd say that's a good strategy, I, I agree. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's stop, I guess, Jeez. Okay. Uh, there's over 8,000 mutual funds to choose from, everything from index funds to actively managed funds. There's also this thing called a targeted retirement fund. You may have heard, th heard them uh, with names like the uh, Vanguard uh, 2060 fund or the Fidelity 2050 fund. And what that, let's say the 2060 fund is money that's, it's, it's, a, it's a mutual fund and it's made up of not only stocks, but it's also made up of bonds too. 
And this year, in the year 2020, it's mostly stock and a little bit of bonds because the year 2060 is so far away. But as it gets closer to the year 2060, the targeted retirement date, it starts to sell off some of its stock and buy more bonds. So it begins to resemble some of those different portfolios that I had shown you earlier. And, and in the year 2060, there's an expectation that you're gonna start drawing money out of that retirement fund. And so it's got more cash and stock, um, cash and bonds in it and less stock, although some stock, maybe a third of it would be in stock in the year 2060. And so there's some growth per piece in it. And the targeted retirement funds have the advantage of automatically balancing. They're the, of all of the choices, they're, they're very attractive in terms of being easy and simple. And so a person who's not terribly interested in the stock market, but does want to invest, I would have them start off thinking, why don't they put all their money in a targeted retirement fund for the year they expect to retire? They just put $40 a week every, every week into there, and they, then they go live their life spend whatever they bring home, pay themselves first, but, but just live their life and it will accumulate into a nice nest egg by the time they retire. It's very simple. If you wanna complicate things a little bit more, then you can start doing other things. You can pick out maybe some different mutual funds, some individual stocks, have some individual things set aside because you know that that's, that's, can be fun and interesting too, but it's not necessary to do that. What is necessary is that you save and invest. There's also socially conscious funds. I don't know whether any of you would be interested in that, but I'm sure you'd be interested in hearing about funds that are specifically geared towards, uh, they, these would be actively managed funds that are have some socially conscious message, like they will only invest in companies that, um, you know, are, uh, have something to do with bringing fresh water to areas of the world that don't have fresh water or, uh, they, they, they absolutely won't invest in any company that does um, animal testing or they're, you know, it's a, it's a you know, a vegan minded, uh, you know, so, so they, they, you know, they have some philosophy, socially conscious philosophy that they're applying in choosing their, as a filter or a screen when they're choosing their stock. So they go, oh yeah, this is a very good stock, looks good on paper, but there's something about them that we won't invest in. And, and so, so that we'll only invest in these other kinds of companies. So that's, that's uh, but when you're buying a mutual fund, you're not just buying one company, you're buying, you're buying a whole basket full of stock. And you, um, so there's also mutual funds that are 100% uh, made up of bonds. Uh, the targeted retirement funds have bonds and stock in them. You can buy them with just bonds in them. You can also have uh, some, you can invest in a mutual type of mutual fund that invests only in real estate. Those are called uh, real estate investment trusts. And um, the, the idea is that you're being diversified, right? So 80% of the large uh, cap funds generate a return less than the S&P 500, according to the scorecard. So good, okay, how am I, I guess I have to somehow, <laughs> Somehow I gotta get rid of this uh, stuff here. Where's my, what does this, okay. Anyone know how to get rid of the uh, little notations? Maybe I do this, save it. Yeah, I think where you got the, um, where you got the crayon, there should be an eraser, there you go. There we go, okay, gang. All right, so you, the, I paraphrase the question slightly for, for y'all. What am I doing on time? Oh, I'm doing terrible on time. Okay, so um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit so I can get to, make sure I can get to all your questions. So um, uh, when can I take withdrawals? Hey, it's a quick key question. If I understand about putting the money in, how do I get it out? And it's very uh, straightforward. You just, um, you, just call them up or online and you tell them to send you a check and they send you a check. If you have a money market account, you can often draw checks right off your money market account as well. So what, one strategy to do is you could have a, let's say if you had a Vanguard account with your S&P 500 Roth IRA uh, 
investment, long-term investment, and then you also had a Vanguard money market account, which is basically just um, invested in, in short-term securities. And you could take a disbursement from the Roth IRA into the money market and then write checks off of the money market and you could, you could have it very accessible. They, I, I don't doubt that there'll be uh, um, in years to come even easier ways to access the money for the consumer. But making withdrawals are, um, are very easy. You just call them and tell them that you want the money and they wire it to you. Um, and if you, uh, there's a, always a tax consideration about how old you are and how much you're taking out. But uh, as far as taking it out, right, uh, you, you, it's easy to do. And the cost of taking withdrawal, so there's no fee for that they charge you for making a withdrawal uh, for under normal circumstances. So, okay. Um, uh, right, we're running short on time, are we not, Professor Meehan? So we want to... Uh, yeah, we are. We're uh, definitely running out of time. Um, some students would be able to stay uh, longer. I know that they they don't have commitments, but if you could, um, they do know like what the S and P is. Uh, that's all in there. If we could cover um, any of the questions that maybe we haven't covered already, maybe you might want to to my students. Maybe you might want to chime in if there's something that uh, you're wondering about that we haven't uh, already covered. Just please do that so you can get your answer. Good, okay. So if you're familiar with the return on the, the this year in the S&P 500, I think it makes for an interesting story, but if you had slept through it like Rip Van Winkle, you would just see that it was like another typical year where you got about a 12% return from, the, from a year ago uh, when you would have missed all the excitement. So um, uh, the things, so we discussed some of these things in the mutual account. I, I was thinking that if you go with simple and straightforward and good tax treatment, then you don't go wrong with your investments. So if you start off with a basic investment uh, as your target retirement account and designate it as a Roth IRA, then you've got a very baseline, simple investment strategy. And uh, I give you a couple examples like the Fidelity 2050 Fund or the Vanguard 2060 Fund as examples of target retirement. You, you can designate it as a Roth IRA for tax treatment and that way all of your contributions are taxed pre-tax or you know, are taxed already. And so after that, your growth and distributions from the Roth IRA are tax free. Um, look for, as far as things to look for, no load funds, index funds, and A shares where you pay the, the cost, you know, A shares, B shares versus C shares are alternatives to no load funds. I, I like no load funds. If it says A shares, B shares or C shares, keep looking, looking for a no load fund because there's plenty of good choices out there. Um, when's the best time to invest 5,000? This was a little game that I had set up, but I guess I'll run through it. It was basically a way of showing you that if you keep on waiting because you don't know what the stock price is going to do, then after five years, you could still have thought, ah, I never, it never seemed like a good time, and you'd still have $5,000. Whereas if, you know, in a, in a fluctuating market like this, what you would do is instead of investing the whole 5000 today, buying 500 shares because they're $10 a piece and ending up with 500 shares that because they're selling for $12 five years later that you've now turned your 5,000 into 6,000. You could have used dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging means that I take the $5,000, I divide it into five piles. I, do, I buy some of it now, some of it later, some of it later still, some of it later still, some of it later still. It doesn't have to be stretched over five years, but you know, if you're investing $2,000 a year, instead of saving up that money, just go ahead and invest it while you're saving. And you're gonna get, sometimes the price is gonna be high and sometimes the price is gonna be low, but the overall average price that you pay is a good price. And you end up buying more than 500 shares with your $5,000. And that means that when the price is up, you make a whole lot more than you would have had you just tried to wait for the right day to do it. Dollar cost averaging is good when you're buying in. And that's why I encourage everyone to start now, not to wait until the right time. Not, don't, don't wait to time the market, have time in the market. Yeah, you guys had some great questions. I'm gonna get right to them. So what's a good rule of thumb in trying to manage your money? 
Well, there's three key rules, diversify, diversify, and diversify. <laughs> right, so you want to put a plan together that is planning on succeeding. Don't, you know, obviously you want to, you want to um, succeed. So identify what that success would mean and then have a plan that if you stay on track, you will achieve it. And then be mindful of where you're spending your money because that many times people are really, really watching closely where their paycheck is and and if there was a discrepancy there but they can't really be sure where they spend it all how much do i need to retire well that's a matter of how long you're going to live and how much you're going to need each month so uh even though uh that uh, you can you can piece that together by by answering that question so that's many one of the one of the reasons people keep working is because they love work but another reason is for the paycheck at the point that you won't need to work anymore is the point where you can retire because you, you could live on what you've saved and what what your investments are and that's a good day good day for you probably i don't know how great it is for the people you work with and then consider those other income sources like uh, rentals part-time social security maybe spousal income that might be coming besides what you'd be drawing off you won't necessarily have to only draw on your nest egg to make it last for your all of your retirement. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip through this, even though this was good. So Father A saved, um, and you know uh, it, it was that piece I had given you. Here's those are the answers that I'd sent you. So the the two dads that were saving for their sons, one of them by just saving five years earlier was able to end up with forty, be able to give their son, you know, their child forty four thousand more dollars because of it um yeah there we talked about acorns and uh save and invest 10 percent of everything you make avoid bad debt i think these are good things by appreciating i love this question i guess we won't uh you, you shall how much time should i take answering it uh, you can take as long as you want they'll stay as long as you're talking if they're able well that's a nice class okay <laughs> so tell me old man what are things you wish you had known when you were young and that actually part of the reason that inspires me to come to college uh to teach college is experiences i, I had had giving seminars to people who are older than told me that they wish they had heard these very things i was telling you when they were 18 or 20 years old you know i so many times i'd hear people say where were you 30 years ago right so so um but but uh um I, so i'm kind of running an experiment where i'm i'm thinking that if i'm telling young people these things that maybe it'll make a big difference in their life if you implement it it will okay so my lessons that i thought uh that i wish i had known earlier treat investing more methodically small steady efforts consistently applied outperform brilliant occasional effort if you don't know it if you should sell today or wait for a better price sell half i have this whole story about yahoo and a couple of friends of mine and how each of us did something different we, we had bought yahoo back in the late 90s for two dollars a share and when it went up to four dollars a share and then eight dollars a share and then sixteen dollars a share and then thirty two dollars a share and then sixty four dollars a share then there was some there was a lot of a lot of talk around the water cooler <laughs> during those couple of months that there was a lot of a lot of escalation on paper force yourself to be disciplined don't allow emotion or compulsion to impact your reason right emotion is useful but not it, it can it confunds your your decision making ability you can have just as much fun playing with 10 percent of your portfolio and leaving the 90 percent automatic you don't have to play with the, all of your, you know, all of your chips. Just take out some of your toys and leave the rest of the toys playing with themselves and whatever it is they do. Random walk theory. This is the idea about um, that the that monkeys throwing darts are just as good at picking winners as uh, as trained stock investors. They do this every year with puppies and stockbrokers, and the the puppies win most of the time the the randomness of it so don't 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 obsess too much about uh choosing the right stock you should obsess instead about your budget things you can control 
and where where you're you know whether you're an investor or not and making sure you don't put too many eggs in one basket okay uh i guess i'd add this one too get it in writing if you uh just live live by that and you'll be okay all right five fast questions from the class here we go question one when is the right time to invest was the question my answer the answer is always now use dollar cost averaging when you get into and out of the market to mitigate timing risk student asks what is the minimum capital you should have before investing my answer get out of high interest debt and have an emergency fund before investing no substantial capital is needed student asks what is a bull market my answer bull market the stock prices are going up because there are more buyers and sellers there's optimism that's driving that up well what's a bear market then well that's pessimism well there's more pessimism than optimism out there uh, it doesn't mean that everyone's pessimistic but uh, the buyers are uh, are fewer and the sellers are many and so the market price goes down what are penny stocks yeah we heard some talk about that well that's stocks which sell for less than a dollar a share so obviously if they're selling for an actual penny that would be a penny stock but anything low price stock is uh, considered a penny stock if the stock sells for 25 cents each let's say and you wanted to buy four shares you could it'll only cost you a dollar I mean, they really sell for so little. So if you paid, if you invest your $100 into this particular stock that's selling for 25 cents a share, then you buy 400 shares. If the price of the stock goes to 26 cents or down to 24 cents, you've had a 4% change that one day, that one moment in your, in your investment, you know? So there's a lot of volatility, a very, very small amount of, of change, a penny or two can, really make or break, uh, you know, it, it expressed as a percentage is gigantic. So it's very attractive uh, to people that, um, you know, uh, um, you know, attractive anyone if they, if they, the, but there's a reason why it's only selling for 25 cents. There's, there's a lot of, there's usually less volume in these uh, uh, particular trades. Uh, it, I think it is, it's very volatile. So, um, but that's what penny stock is. Okay. Five more fast questions from the class. Student asks, is it beneficial to use an employer-backed retirement plan? Is it? Is it beneficial? Yeah, it is. Definitely contribute at least enough to get the company matched. Try to increase your contributions by 1% more each year. There's a little tip, right? So you start off at 6% when you first work, then a year, year anniversary, make it 7%. Then eight. On your birthday, make it nine. See if you can creep it up. Little, little small incremental jumps like that. You're gonna, don't put it off. Say, oh, someday I'm gonna put in 10, but I won't put in anything now. No, put in something now, make it a little bit more every time. Inch by inch, life's a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. With COVID-19 affecting the stock market, what types of companies are worth investing in currently? Well, I throw down a few ideas here. Staples like soap and consumables like toilet paper. Streaming services seem big. Home improvement did really well this year really you know uh, like uh, home depot and lowe's and so forth did very well uh tools and so forth and then pfizer and moderna uh, the big uh, winners in the race to get the uh, vaccine in there the investment club uh is uh meets every wednesday at three o'clock you're welcome to uh join us we did a moderna purchase at the beginning of the year which uh, paid off big time is investing during this time period worth it at all? Yeah, absolutely. People are always waiting too long to get started. So uh, the, in fact, times of uncertainty are the most exciting in the stock market. At 18, how much money would you suggest to take out of your checks to put into a retirement fund? So there's two answers. I said uh, $40 a week would be one way to think about it or 10%. That strikes a good balance between having 90% of your money to spend uh, now and and 10% later and get in the habit of living within your means and you're going to have enough. What's a good long-term investment strategy? You know it, right? Invest 10% in a target index fund designated as a Roth IRA. Live within your budget live and live well. So those are the five. Very good. I salute you. Thank you for your time. Your excellent questions. I hope you enjoyed this uh, piece and I encourage you to act on your action plan that you put together. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so thank much, you. Thank you so much. You're right. Thank take you. Care, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you.
like I'm not like I don't know my money is like precious so it's like <laughs> I don't usually invest <laughs> So right, this completely right. like changed the mindset. So <laughs> thank yeah. you. I had a Mama dollar and Papa dollar and let them make a family. <laughs> um, I was just 